Hey guys, Michael here, co-founder of Studicata. In today's video, I just wanna briefly go over the most frequently tested rules and contracts, at least if you're sitting for the uniform bar exam and taking the multi-state essay exam. Quick note before I jump into it, just wanna to mention to you that if you're interested in learning more about the most frequently tested rules from every subject, you should check out our top 120 list. I'll put a link in the description. In that document, we lay out the most frequently tested rules from each subject of the multi-state essay exam. Project took us over a thousand hours to complete, and you can download it right now for free. Link in the description, but not what I wanna talk about in today's video. In this video, I wanna focus on contracts, uh, specifically the most frequently tested rules in contracts. So number one, the most frequently tested rule over the last 20 years is law applicability. Whether the common law or UCC governs the fact pattern is always going to be your most tested rule because that's almost always at issue in a contracts essay question. Your second most tested rule is going to be expectation damages. Again, remedies is another area that's almost always tested if contracts is tested. And within the umbrella of remedies, expectation damage is gonna be your most frequently tested rule there. And then in the three spot, your third most frequently tested rule on down to your 10th most tested rule. Um, those seven spots is kind of like a seven way tie for all the rules that encompass formation of the contract. So mutual assent and consideration and everything that falls beneath that, you know, offer, acceptance, consideration, um, and, and everything associated with those rules, depending on how you really break that up, you know, it could be a little bit more, a little bit less, just the way that we've chosen to break it up. If you download our top 120 list, you'll see that those, you know, from the three spot to the 10 spot, is all gonna be formation rules. But the main thing that you need to be thinking there in terms of formation is mutual assent and consideration. Okay, so that's your most frequently tested rules. Common law versus UCC, number one. Number two, expectation damages. And number three on down, formation requirements to form a traditional enforceable contract. So let's take a step back before we jump into these rules specifically and just talk about contracts as as from a big picture in terms of the multi-state you know contracts is, is a very interesting subject in the sense that the whole thing your whole contracts analysis at least for the essay portion is one giant decision tree and it, you can really break it up into three questions no matter where you are in a contract law fact pattern analysis, you know, when you're reading the call of the questions, there's really only three categories that you can be in, in a contracts analysis. And that's going to be formation, performance, and remedies. Um, and in terms of frequency, formation and remedies are going to be your most tested areas, but performance is still tested a lot. Need to know a lot there as well, not to say to neglect those areas, but in terms of frequency, you're typically gonna see formation and remedies tested more often than you're gonna see performance issues tested. So what do I mean when I'm saying formation, performance, and remedies? You can think of this in terms of three questions. Your starting point in a contract analysis is whether a traditional enforceable contract was formed. If you have a traditional contract, the next question is, was that contract performed? So once you have a contract and you've determined that it wasn't performed, what remedies are available to the plaintiff? So was a traditional contract formed? If so, was the contract performed? If not, what remedies are available to the plaintiff? That is three questions that sums up your entire contract law analysis. No matter where you are, you're almost always going to be within one of those categories of formation, performance, or remedies. So starting with our first question, was a traditional enforceable contract formed? To form a contract, you need mutual assent, a traditional contract, I should say. You need mutual assent and consideration. Mutual assent is just an offer and an acceptance. What is an offer? An offer is a manifestation of willingness to enter into the agreement by the offer rule. This is governed by an objective test. And it has to create a power of acceptance in the offeree. This is a little nuance that you have to look out for. But the main thing is 
You want to make sure that the outward actions of the offeror manifest a willingness to enter into the agreement that's creating a power of acceptance in the offeree so that the offeree can simply say, I accept and know that he has concluded the deal. That's what you're going to look for. Um, power of acceptance is usually just kind of, um, in other words, it's saying that the offeror needs to direct the offer to a specific offeree. You know, I can't just walk around Times Square with a megaphone shouting out, I offer to sell this textbook for, you know, $200, right, to the whole crowd. I'm not directing that offer at any specific person. I'm not creating a power of acceptance in anyone by doing that shouting out to a crowd. Generally, it has to be directed at a specific offeree and create that power of acceptance so someone can simply say, I accept and know that they've concluded the deal. Um, the main exception there is obviously for reward offers and contest offers. If I go outside though and I post a flyer on a, you know, post somewhere on a sidewalk, you know, that my cat is missing and I'm promising to pay anyone $100 if they find and return the cat to me, I, that is a valid offer. Um, so that's an exception to that um, creating a power of acceptance. Also, the other thing, the third thing you kind of want to look out for in an offer analysis is remember that there are certain terms that are required in the offer, depending on whether you're in the common law or UCC universe, which is the most tested rule <laughs> in contracts. So I should probably talk about that. So I'll come back. So I guess, yeah, the, uh, see, look, this is why, this is why you start a contracts analysis. Always, look, I've made a mistake. I jumped into my contract analysis without discussing UCC or common law, which is one of the worst things that you can actually do on the bar exam. And look what just happened. I tripped myself up. So the very first thing before we enter into an offer analysis, the most tested, most tested rule is whether the common law or UCC governs your fact pattern, right? And that's usually a very easy analysis. If, you're, if the contract deals with services or real estate, generally the common law applies. If the contract deals with goods, the UCC applies. If you have a mixed contract that deals with both goods and services, the predominant purpose controls. So if the predominant purpose involves goods, you're in UCC. If the predominant purpose involves services, you're in common law territory. And remember, you have to pick and choose. It's either you know one or the other. You can't be applying both at the same time to one single contract. Now, if you're dealing with a fact pattern where there's multiple contracts, you know, a divisible contract that can be broken up into separate mini contracts, then you could, you know, each contract is only governed by one set of rules. So for each contract, you can only be under the common law or the UCC. You can't some mix of both, right? Um, so that's the main, uh, the main gateway issue in contracts that you always want to discuss. As soon as you flip open and you see that you're being tested on contracts, you can almost immediately go to your laptop and just type that in. Law applicability, common law versus you see, even before you read the fact pattern, you can pretty much type that into your laptop because you don't want to forget about it like I just did and start an analysis and then you're like, oh crap, you know, I need to go back and discuss that. So. Um, always a good idea to start your analysis with that. And even if it turns out that it's not explicitly tested, it's just good form. You know, all of the passing essays that I've read in contracts generally start with that uh, heading. You know, law applicability, common law, UCC. You know, it'll take you 30 seconds to run through that and then you go. But anyways, going back to the offer. So I was talking about the requirements to form a valid offer. It's an objective manifestation of willingness to enter into the agreement that creates a power of acceptance in the offeree. So those are your two main requirements, right? Objective willingness, remember objective, that's outward actions and appearances, not subjective hidden intentions, and um, creating the power of acceptance in the offeree, which is what we just talked about with the exception of contest offers and reward offers. But the third kind of requirement that you can think of in terms of the offer is to form a valid offer, there are required terms that you have to specify in your objective willingness to enter into the agreement. You have to specify, depending on what universe you're in, whether you're in the common law or, uni or UCC, if you're in the common law, there's four terms that you generally have to include in your offer in order for it to be valid. 
and that's going to be the parties, subject, quantity, and price term. Under the UCC, you don't have to mention the price. You can still form a valid offer without a price term. Um, and that's a big distinction to make sure. So if you're dealing with a goods contract, you're under the UCC, you don't need to specify price to form a valid offer. Um, but you're still going to need party, subject, and quantity. Um, so that's offer. Wow. To form a valid offer, that's kind of the three things that you should be thinking about. Objective willingness, you know, measured by that objective standard. Um, creating the power of acceptance, which really just means you have to direct it to a specific offeree. And um, that terms required, which is a little different depending on if you're in the common law or UCC. One final note, uh, which is sometimes tested, is advertisements. Advertisements are generally not a, an offer. They're an invitation to deal because you're not conferring a power of acceptance to the other side, typically with an advertisement. Uh, if you see an ad in a newspaper, can you simply say, I accept and know that you've concluded the deal? Normally, the answer is no. So an advertisement is generally considered an invitation to deal, not an offer. However, if the advertisement's extremely specific and leaves nothing open to negotiation, it could count, constitute an offer. All right, that's basically the, the main points to remember with the offer, the most tested parts of the offer. So remember, to form a valid contract, you need mutual assent, which is an offer and acceptance. So once you have an offer, the next question is whether you have acceptance of that offer. Acceptance, um, the main thing to think about with acceptance, again, it's, it has to be an objective willingness to enter into the agreement by the offeree. Similar to the rule of the offeror forming the offer, same thing. It has to be specifically directed. It has to be fall under the objective test. Everything's the same for acceptance as offer, except that you have to remember that the acceptance is governed by the master of the offer rule. So remember, the offeror is the master of the offer, which means that the offeree has to accept in the manner that the offeror has specified. So if I say that I'll sell you this pencil, my pencil, which I just misplaced, but imagine that I have a pencil and I say, I'll sell you my pencil for $10. In order to accept, you have to do a backward somersault and then hand me a $10 bill, right? In order to accept, if you just say, I accept, you haven't accepted my offer. You have to do the somersault and hand me the $10 bill and then you've accepted, right? And normally this is dealing with unilateral and bilateral. I don't wanna get into all of that. But if I require you to accept by performance, you have to accept by performance. If I require you to accept by a promise, you have to accept by a promise. The offer roar is master of the offer. That's the main thing to remember with an acceptance. Otherwise, the analysis is pretty similar to the offer. So that's mutual assent, offer and acceptance. Um, the other thing that you have to remember when you're talking about an offer and acceptance is kind of the timeline of the offer. Uh, and remember that the offer can be terminated before acceptance. And, and you have to think of it in terms of this timeline. Once an offer is formed, what happens from that point until it is accepted? If it's terminated, if in any way, if the offer is terminated between formation and acceptance, the offer is dead. It can't be accepted, it can't be revived unless a new offer is made. So how do you, determine, how do you terminate an offer? There's six ways to do it. And remember, all of these have to happen before acceptance. The main ways, at least, to terminate an offer are one, remember the offeror can, is free to revoke their offer before acceptance by express communication. So if I offer to sell you my pencil for $10, and then one second later I say, actually, I revoke my offer, and then you say I accept right after I've revoked it, there's no acceptance, right? The offer was terminated the second that I said I revoke my offer. That's called an express revocation. Next, you have a constructive revocation. This occurs if the offeree learns that the offeror has taken an action that is absolutely inconsistent with the continuing ability to contract. So if I offer to sell you my pencil for $10, 
and you say, let me think about it. And then an hour later, you learn that I actually sold that very pencil to another student for $10 and you run back to me and say, wait, 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 I accept. That's no good. The offer was terminated the moment that you realized that I had already sold that pencil. I, you, that's a constructive revocation. You learned that I took an action that was absolutely inconsistent with the continuing ability to contract. At that moment, the offer was terminated. It cannot be revived unless a new offer is made. So that's express revocation, constructive revocation. Next, you have a classic rejection. I offer to sell you my pencil for $10 and you say, I reject. And then you say, wait, actually I changed my mind, I accept, right? It doesn't matter. The offer was terminated the second that you rejected it. So your acceptance after the fact is meaningless, has no, no bearing on this. The offer is dead. Remember, it cannot be revived unless a new offer is formed. So that's rejection. Next, you have a counter offer. Say that I offer to sell you my pencil for $10 and you say it's a deal for five. And then you think about it for a second. You're like, wait, I changed my mind. I accept your original offer. No good. If you, if I offer to sell you my pencil for $10 and you say, I'll do it for five, you've made a counter offer, which terminates my original offer. You can't go back and, and accept my original offer now after you've made a counter offer because you terminated my offer when you made that counter offer. The next two ways aren't tested as often, but if a reasonable amount of time passes from offer until acceptance, that will terminate the deal. So if I uh, offer to sell you my pencil for $10 and a year later, you call me up and say, I accept, that's probably not going to work because a reasonable amount of time has passed. Um, and usually that's a matter of weeks, not days and then the offer will terminate after that reasonable amount of time passes. Although, remember, generally the more expensive the item, the more value you're dealing with in the deal, the longer of what a reasonable amount of time will be, right? You might think about buying a big purchase like a new car or house or something for weeks versus a $10 pencil, you know, that's probably a decision you make pretty instantly. So what's reasonable will change depending on the value of the deal. And finally, you have a death, right? So if I, uh, if I offer to sell you my pencil for $10 and then in this instant right now, I have a heart attack and die. And then after I die, you accept, you say, I accept, wait, you, know, you look at me on the ground, you're like, I accept your offer. It's not gonna work. The offer terminates the moment that I die. The offeror dies. Um, so that's your six main ways to terminate an offer. And remember, if any of those occur in the timeline before acceptance, the offer is dead. It's terminated. You can't revive it. You can't accept it. It's done unless a new offer is formed. Um, and sometimes, you know, that can get dicey on an on a essay. So you really need to follow the timeline carefully and look at what's happening between the formation of the offer and acceptance. And if any of those six things have happened, you're not going to have mutual assent for that offer. Um, that's going to be terminated before acceptance, killing mutual assent. Because remember, mutual assent is offer and acceptance. And mutual assent is required to form a traditional contract. So that is the acceptance portion of mutual assent. What's the other portion? You have to have consideration. So you have to have an offer, acceptance, and consideration to form a traditional contract. So what is consideration? Consideration is a bargain for exchange that establishes a benefit to the promisor or a detriment to the promisee. Um, the way I like to think of, that's the official definition that you should type on your essay. That's what the buzzwords the bar examiners are gonna be looking for. The way I like to think about consideration is in terms of the bargain for exchange. There has to be something of value, something that is worth bargaining over for both parties in order to have that bargain for exchange. The most common example you see of this is a gift promise or a conditional gift. So if I offer to sell you my truck for $8,000, uh, no, 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 sorry. If I offer to sell you my truck that is worth $8,000, if you agree to come and pick it up from my house and say you live two minutes away from me. So I'm offering to give you my truck for free. It's an $8,000 value. If you will just come over to my house two minutes away and pick it up. 
There's not consideration there, right? There's no bargain for exchange. I'm not bargaining for you to come over to my house and pick it up. There's no real value there, right? There has to be something worth bargaining over for both parties. Sure, the truck is worth bargaining over, but not you coming to pick it up. I'm not really bargaining for you to come over two minutes to pick it up from my house. That's a conditional gift. That's not consideration. Um, the other ways that you see consideration tested are uh, if, if you have a gift promise, you have adequacy of consideration, which is similar to gift promises. So if I offer to sell you my truck that's worth $8,000 for $1, um, that's not going to be consideration. That's a pretense of consideration. That's not adequate. You know, I can't call that consideration. It's an $8,000 truck and I'm selling it to you for $1. That's not going to be adequate consideration. Hey guys, sorry about that. I'm recording this on my iPhone and apparently I ran out of storage in the middle of recording that video. So I just droned on for a long time and it didn't record. So you know um, that you're recording way too long in a video when your phone's running out of storage. So I'll try to speed this up. Um, where it cut off, we were talking about consideration. Um, and how a gift promise is not consideration. The other things that you need to look out for if consideration is tested are illusory promises. Sometimes the bar examiners like to test this. So if I offer to sell you my truck for $8,000 and you say, sure, I accept if I feel like it or I'll accept it when I'm in the mood, right? That's not a clear committal to the deal, not consideration. That's not gonna work. That's an illusory promise. You wanna look out for that. The other thing that gets tested a lot in the consideration umbrella is past consideration. Remember, past consideration is not adequate consideration. So the common way that this is tested is normally with a moral obligation um, to try and trick people up. So imagine that I'm showing you the safety features of my truck, I'm trying to sell it to you and the thing catches on fire. You know, I'm like revving an engine or so, showing you something, the thing catches on fire, blows up, I'm stuck in the truck and there's flames everywhere. You run over with a fire extinguisher, pull me out of the truck, save my life. I'm so grateful that you've saved me that I offered to pay you $500 in exchange for your rescue and you accept, right? Is that going to be an offer and acceptance and consideration, forming a traditional enforceable contract? No, that's not consideration, that's past consideration. Um, that's my offer to pay you $500 for something that you've already completed, the rescue of me, is something that's happened in the past, that's past consideration, that's not adequate consideration, so that's not gonna be enough to form a traditional enforceable contract. Although some jurisdictions recognize this as a moral obligation that creates a duty to pay. So it's an alternative legal theory of enforcement to enforce a promise, um, which you would want to discuss very briefly on a bar exam if something like this was tested, and it actually has been tested uh, recently. I forget what year exactly, but within the last five years, that has been tested and they did want to see in the answer that you recognized that some jurisdictions recognize that a moral obligation creates a subsequent duty to pay in that scenario. Okay, so that wraps up formation. We've talked about mutual assent, which is the offer and acceptance and consideration. Remember, you do also have performance as your next category, but remember we said performance is not tested as frequently as formation and remedies is. So in this video, I'm not gonna go too much into performance, but that again, is not to say that performance isn't important. It is extremely important. You need to know the issues and rules in performance, but we're gonna skip performance and go to remedies. So in this, in this scenario, normally what's gonna happen on a bar exam question, the reason that remedies is tested so frequently is almost always in the call of the question, they're gonna ask you to discuss, well, they might ask you to discuss whether a traditional enforceable contract was formed and they might ask you some performance stuff, but at the end, they normally say, okay, despite all of your analysis, whatever conclusion you just came to, let's now assume that there was a breach of contract, what remedies would be available? And this is why remedies is so often tested because normally you're gonna get that call to the question, so you need to be able to discuss Remedies and remedies you can kind of break up into two categories money damages and equitable remedies 
Money damages are going to be tested more often. Money damages consist of expectation damages, reliance damages, restitution. You could also potentially have liquidated damages in there, but that's not tested very often. Um, so we will focus on for this expectation and reliance um, because those are going to be the main two that you want to discuss for remedy. So what is expectation damages? Expectation damages, I normally tell students to think of this as the crystal ball analysis because what expectation damages? So you're assuming that there's been a breach of contract. So the plaintiff is owed some sort of remedy. And if you're talking about expectation damages, this requires you to look into your crystal ball and say, okay, what would have happened if this contract had been performed as promised? If this contract had been performed as promised, what economic position would the plaintiff be in? This requires you to look into the crystal ball and see into the future and predict the economic position that the plaintiff would have been in had the contract been performed as promised. And the main caveat that you have to remember here when you're looking into your crystal ball and looking into what would have happened, you have to be able to prove that with what's called reasonable certainty. That's the standard of proof that we're looking for here. You can't just say, you know, some, you allege something that's very unlikely to have occurred and it would have added up to all these damages. You have to be able to prove where the position, the economic position the plaintiff would have been in with reasonable certainty. And the fact pattern will always give you a fact that either makes this go one way or the other. It'll say something that makes it look like it would have been reasonably certain or that it wouldn't have been reasonably certain that these damages would have accumulated. Um, so that's expectation damages. You're looking into the crystal ball and you're like, what economic position would this plaintiff have been in had the contract been performed as promised? Reliance damages doesn't look into a crystal ball. All you're doing with reliance damages is saying, okay, how much did the plaintiff spend out of pocket in reliance on this contract? And let's reimburse them for those expenditures. Um, that's all you're doing there. You're not making any predictions. I see this sometimes messed up. I want to be very clear that this isn't requiring you to make any type of prediction with reasonable certainty. None of that. All you're doing is looking at how much did the plaintiff spend out of pocket in reliance on this deal. And now under reliance damages, we're going to reimburse them for that. So. Um, the, the example here, just to sum up the difference between expectation and reliance damages. So imagine that at Studicata, we want our website redone, right? We're for the, for the next bar exam, we want an all new website. So I go out to some website developer and I'm going to pay them money to build us this new website. Contract is formed. They agreed to have it done by May 1. You know, we want to be ready for the July bar exam. Sales typically will start sometime in late April, May, when people start to think about bar prep. So we have to have it done by May 1. Without a website, we can't sell anything. Studicata loses a ton of money. We go out of business. So it's absolutely critical. This website's done by May 1. The contract specifies that. That's what the performance is. We need this new website by May 1. So say, of course, you know, this contract is breached. We get to the end of July and there was a million problems with the website. They couldn't do it. We were down for the whole bar exam run. We didn't have a website up, so we made no money. Um, and we actually ended up losing money because we have to pay all the different expenses that we have and we couldn't generate any revenue because we didn't have our website. And it's all this um, web developer's fault. He breached the contract. We tried to get other ways to fix it, but we couldn't do it. We tried to mitigate our damages, but we couldn't um, reasonably. So here we are. We want to sue for expectation damages. So what is the court going to do? You have to look into the crystal ball and say, okay, what would have happened had this website been developed as it was supposed to be developed by May 1? If this website had been up and running as was promised in the contract by May 1, what would have happened? What economic position would Studicata be in? And the way the court would determine that is you would look at our past sales records. You would say, okay, this is how much they made last July and this year and this year, and they could look. And fortunately at Studicato, you know, we have a consistent sales record and we could show some steady growth and we could say, look, this is what we estimate we would have made had this website developer, you know, done as they promised. 
And that would be our expectation damage, looking into the crystal ball and kind of estimating what our sales would have been, looking at the past. And the question would be, could we prove that with reasonable certainty with a consistent sales record? We probably could. If you're a new business, which the bar examiners love to use, a new venture, a new business, and you don't have a proven sales record, it's gonna be much harder to prove expectation damage because you need that reasonable certainty. So let's say, to, to just talk about reliance damages, Let's say also same exact fact pattern, but in, in anticipation of this website. So in April, when the web developer we think is making our brand new website, we want to have a big launch party for our new website. So we go out and we spend a bunch of money, we spend thousands and thousands of dollars. Say we spend $5,000 in Facebook ads to tell everybody out there, look, we have this new website, it's coming out May 1, we're super excited about it, we send out these ads, we pay $5,000 for those ads. Of course, the contract is breached, not performed. If we were to sue for reliance damages, we could recover that $5,000 we spent in reliance on this contract being performed. Right? That doesn't require any crystal ball, any estimates. We just say, look, we paid this much in reliance on the contract. This is what we're out of pocket. We want to be reimbursed for that. That's going to be reliance damages. Also, quick note, you generally have to pick one or the other. You can't sue for every type of damage between um, expectation damages and reliance damages. You have to elect one or the other. And generally, expectation damages is going to be the most. Plaintiffs are generally going to elect for expectation damages which is why that's the most frequently tested you always want to as a default be thinking about expectation damages discuss that if they ask what remedies are available for a breach of contract you should almost always be thinking expectation damages but if you do see some sort of out-of-pocket expense in reliance then you can discuss reliance okay so that's the main things to look out for in formation and remedies which are your main subject areas um, if you want to know more about performance and about um, some other notes on formation performance, I did make a little decision tree. Forgot to mention that in the beginning of this video, but a link to that will be in the description. That'll kind of overview everything I just talked about and give you some mnemonics um, with a cat theme. You maybe have seen the cats running around the background, so a lot of my mnemonics all have to do with cats because I feel like that's easy to remember um, for me and anyone else that sees all the cats around uh, when you be when you're running through your mnemonics you can think of that um, but anyways uh, i will put a link to that in the description and that's going to lay it out for you um, everything i just talked about in broad strokes and some ways to remember it and think about it as you actually approach your essay um, with that guys sorry that this has been such a long video but i'll let you get back to it. I wish you the absolute best of luck in your preparation for the bar exam and I'll see you at our next video.